This is Matt Brown, and you're listening to Just a Good Conversation. Even in death, David Legg can bring people together and they can become friends. In a meadow in Montana, I was interviewing Bill Kennenberg for a documentary I was working on. He was talking about his good friend Dave and their love of baseball and some wonderful memories they had shared together. At that second, I knew I had to have Bill on my podcast. A lifelong baseball player and coach with not one but two Coach of the Year awards and with over 600 wins under his belt, why wouldn't I want to talk to this guy? I never grew up. I never had a real job. You know, I played all, all my childhood, lucky to play in college, and then started coaching it. So it's consumed my life, basically. And, and But, it, you know, I've never had a real job. Um, you know, people have always kind of made fun of me, saying, that's not a real job. Do you, what else do you do? I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to our archives. My guests have ranged from college professors, Hall of Fame basketball players, sports writers, and small business owner, Gabby Mullinex. You have to take a risk or you're never going to know what you could have been. So that, that to me, that speaks to Fullerton Photo. That speaks to, this was a huge risk. I didn't even know how huge of a risk it was. <laughs> but so that, that's, you know, the first part. Be guided by passion, enjoy the journey, and make sure that when you're doing this, you're not just playing for yourself, but you're playing for everybody else around you. The rest of my conversation with Gabby can be found on our archives at justgoodconversation.com. Let's take a quick break from my sponsor before diving into my conversation with Bill Kinnenberg. I've got a wonderful person and a pretty damn good baseball coach on the podcast. How are you, Bill? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for uh, having me, and it's it's nice to be with you this morning. Yes, I mean the the last the, the, the last time we were together, and really the first time we met, were under some you know interesting circumstances at at a service for a dear friend of yours and a, and a person I knew for a very long time, um, Mr. Leg. It's great that we it's it's when things like that happen, it's interesting how people get to connect. And if anything came out of that, it was nice that you and I got to connect at that service. And then months yeah. later, I have you on the podcast. Yeah, that was uh, a, a sad time for a lot of people. Uh, he t- uh, Dave touched a lot of people, um, both on and off the, the, the baseball field. But uh, his days at, at Wyoming were very special with me and and uh, also with the players that we had, uh, uh, he was a beloved coach uh, at the, you know, at the University of Wyoming with our baseball program, and and did amazing things for us. And, and uh, sad day, uh, uh, you know, that he's no longer with us, and uh, tough deal that he went through. But uh, man, he he impacted a lot of people. I mean, I knew about him. I knew of him. Uh, I. Was his one of his sons was at Fullerton when I was there, and even at Long Beach. But right. I mean, to the way his uh, ability to connect with people and touch their lives was phenomenal. I mean, when you first met him, did you get that sense that Dave was that kind of a man? Um, you know, it, it was interesting. You know, he was at San Diego State, and I was at uh, UTEP when we first met, and we were playing, and and. You know, I, I always admired the way San Diego State played um, the game. They, they they were well coached. Coach Dietz was was uh, uh, you know really a good coach, and Dave was under him and it played for him, and and so we kind of connected that way. And it was always you know on the field, um, but I always thought in the back of my mind, I need to to find out how they're doing it. And so when we had a, a, a job open up and. I reached out to him in hopes that he would leave San Diego <laughs> and come to Laramie, Wyoming, which are of all places, um, you know, and he did. Um, and it was a great five years. We, we put together very good teams, uh, had a great run in, in 89 and 90. Um, but he, he was an outstanding person, outstanding uh, uh, coach, and he did connect with people. Uh, he had a way about him, very calm. 
very, um, 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 he just measured every word he said, kind of, and and um, he, he was very good at that. He 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 was very thoughtful at, uh, uh, in his presentations to people, and uh, you liked him. He was a likable guy. So uh, all those things, uh, you know, made him the person that he is, and he, he was a tremendous guy. All right, you're you're missing something there, though, Bill. He might have been a great person, but you must have been one hell of a salesperson to get someone from San Diego <laughs> to Wyoming. <laughs> what the hell were you doing uh, coaching? You should have been selling stock. <laughs> yeah, I, I, maybe. Uh, um, and, you know, that that uh, that pipeline that he created, you know, because he knew uh, all those kids in San Diego. We had four or five really good players from the San Diego area with us and and. Um, you know, he created that uh, pipeline for, for us, and and um, you know, we we were able to snag some really good players to to come to Laramie and and play in the in the cold and and get get out of the get out of the the nice weather of, of San Diego. So, <laughs> yeah, he was a good salesman too. Yeah, you guys together should have yeah. uh, been working for Goldman Sachs. What the hell are you yeah. doing coaching baseball? All right, so so tell me this, because this was interesting when I found this, is how in God's green earth were you born in Chile, of all places? <laughs> well, my, my father was a copper miner. He was a mining engineer. Uh-huh. Uh, and he graduated from the Naval Academy in 1945. And just when the war ended, um, and uh, graduated from the Naval Academy and, and got his degree in engineering and started working in, in uh, copper mining uh, uh, businesses. And he started working for Kennecott uh, Mining Company and was sent to Chile for seven years to work in a mine there. And my brother next to me was born there. My, I'm the youngest of four. And my sister, my oldest sister and uh, oldest brother uh, moved with my parents naturally down there. They spent seven years went to school there. Both my sister and my older brother had schooling there as they lived there. And they absolutely loved it. We lived in a really, I guess, a very small little mining camp, basically, uh, outside of Santiago. And uh, I was born, and three months later, they came back to the, to the state. So um, I didn't experience it or don't remember it naturally, and I haven't been back. But I do have my Chilean uh, uh, birth certificate. And, um, you know, now with all this world baseball classic and Olympics, <laughs> you know, my, my son was talking to me the other day. He says, guys, doesn't Chile have a baseball team I could play in the world <laughs> baseball classic? You know, because, you know, you were born there. And, it, yeah, it, uh, we have – they don't have baseball, so we I should move down there and start creating it or, or something. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how – that's how that happened. And, and, uh, but my parents and, and family really, really enjoyed it there, their seven years. Yeah. That's, that might, that's amazing. I figured either it had to be that or your parents were missionaries or something. It's yeah. not normally, you know, you're born in Chile and then end up spending the most of your life either in, you know, the Southwest like you did. Right. Right. Wow. That must yeah. have been phenomenal. What an experience that must have been for your older brother and sister though, to have that kind of, you know, my, my sister is still fluent in Spanish, and um, and uh, um, my parents were, were fluent in Spanish. So I, I wish I would have been able to do that and, and learn and, and learn the language properly. But uh, uh, they really, like I said, they really enjoyed it. They uh, they had fun down there. It was a little rustic, I, I would I, imagine, living yeah, there. I bet. And, but my mom, who's 100 and still living, are you, you know, really? Yeah, she's still living in Phoenix, and and uh, um, you know she talks about it still to this day. Of of you know, they really had a pretty nice life during that time, and and uh, yeah, uh, they, they like I said, they enjoyed it. And and every year, my parents would go down there and visit friends. Um, you know, after he retired, they spent a lot of time in Chile, and and would go down there and fish and and, uh, visit friends and, and, uh, uh, so they, they really loved, uh, the country of Chile. 
Yeah, that's one of those countries you've got to like either have friends or connection to go to because nobody says, well, for the summer, you know, let's spend two weeks in Chile. It's like, let's spend two weeks in Italy. But it's a beautiful country. Everything that I've seen of it, it's just stunning. Yeah. Yeah. So, how and when are you exposed to baseball? Uh, As soon as I can remember. um, You know, I had two older brothers. Um, My dad was. uh, love sports okay. um so my brothers were all involved in in football basketball baseball uh growing up so when i was three or four years old they were you know starting their leagues and 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 i was always around uh, um and for some reason i took to to baseball and and um I would walk around the house. I can still remember this a little bit. And I was tiny and my parents would tell me I had a tick. I would do a, a pitching motion, just walking around the house. And when I was four years old, um, so that kind of started it. And then as, as I started growing up, I, I was pretty good as a kid. I think I was better uh, when I was a kid than I was in college, but uh <laughs> Um, early bloomer you were, huh? Yeah, I was an early bloomer in baseball. And, and um, I think my sophomore year in high school, I was the best that I ever was and, and never got much better than that. But but anyway, um, um, and, and I would I would bat boy every game that I could for some reason. I, I just wanted to be on the field. And, and um, you know, I still have very good friends. And, and this was all in Douglas, Arizona, um, you know, little town south of Tucson, right Mm -hmm. on the border of Mexico and Arizona. And, and, um, but my brothers would, would play. And when they were in high school or, or, uh, summer leagues, I would go to every game and I would bat boy and, um, you know, and and I'd ride on the buses with the high school team and travel to Tucson to play games. And, and for some reason, the coaches let me do that. And, uh, um, you know, it just happened that I was always around it and I really liked and, and thought highly of the high school coaches and, you know, two guys, a guy by the name of Ike Sharp, who was, uh, you know, a legendary Arizona coach and a guy by the name of, uh, uh, of, uh, Ray Barain, who was a basketball coach at Douglas high school at the time, they were kind of my heroes. Wow. And, and, you know, and I, and I, I've told them and Ike's no longer with us, but, but I've told them that's the reason I, I coached because of you two guys. I looked up to you. I thought you were great. I thought you were, and I wanted to be like you. Huh. And I thought all my life I was going to be a high school coach all the way up through, um, I finished college and, and, and was ready to be a high school coach. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, you dove right in. You didn't, when I was looking at the research, you didn't like divert off and spend time in a lumber yard or, or anything. No. I mean, you were right in baseball from day one. I was so lucky um, throughout my, my career. I, I was, you know, being in the right place at the right time are all those things and, and who you know is so important. And, and, people that helped me get to where I am, you know, it was fantastic. I, I was so lucky. Um, and, and this is how I got into college baseball. This is, this, uh, I, I had graduated from the university of Arizona and I went to Pueblo, Colorado to be an assistant for the Pueblo chieftains, a summer league team. The head coach was, um, the Cochise junior college head coach. And, and uh, one morning, um, we we were on our way to have breakfast, and we lived in the dorms at Southern Colorado uh, University. And walking down the hall, he says, uh, "Yeah, a guy by the name of Jim Lawler just called." Um, and Jim had been at Gonzaga, and I just watched him in the regionals in Tucson. And Jim had some connections to the University of Arizona, and, and so I knew who he was, and I guess he knew who I was, and. Um, um, and I said, yeah, what did, what did Jim want? He said, well, he just took the job at UTEP. And at that time, UTEP was just the worst 
baseball team in the country. Um, you know, they, they put nothing into it and, and they were in the whack. And, and my first year at, at Arizona, you know, we played against them. They, it was, it was, you know, not a, not a good team. Right. And I said, why would Jim go to, to UTEP? And then the next sentence was, I wonder if he needs an assistant coach. <laughs> and, 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 the coach turned around, walked right back to his dorm room, called Jim and says, Hey, are you looking for any coaches? And Jim says, yeah, I've got a graduate assistance position. I uh, literally was in El Paso three weeks later and that's how it happened. And that's how it started. I was all ready, set to go to amphitheater high school in Tucson, Arizona and, and help with football and be uh, an assistant baseball coach. I find it, <laughs> it is such a baseball thing that you would wonder why in God's green earth, some coach would take such a, you know, downtrodden program. And then within a split second, your next thought is, I'd like to join him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's when you know it, you love baseball. It, well, and, and it was, and the other part was really funny because my father had, had said, hey, Bill, I think you need to go get your master's and, and. And I said, Dad, I do not want to go to another day of school in my life. I'm I'm done with school. I, I just want to I just want to start working. I just want to start coaching. What did you and get your degree he, in at Arizona? Yeah, I, I did finish it, and and but he wanted me to get my master's, and and so here was an opportunity for me as a graduate assistant to coach and to and to go to back to school. So I did it. <laughs> yeah. What was your degree in? Physical physical education. Okay, all right. So, you yeah. know, you, you got that done, and you know, it's time to you know get into baseball like you loved. Yeah, yeah. Were so when so, you were playing, did you feel like you were starting to formulate your mind like a like a baseball coach? You know, because there's, I mean, you've been around it long enough. You know, there's some players that they just don't understand what a coach is thinking. Yeah. Well, number one, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't the greatest of players I, I i survived so that was the 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 first thoughts of come on just survive every day and, <laughs> and 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 try to make it through and get get outs i was a pitcher and just try to get the, the next out that was my main focus i always knew i wanted to coach i always knew it and so yeah i i would i would I would listen and 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 watch and study. I guess I, I think when you're in the moment, you probably don't realize that you're doing it. But as I look back, you know, I, I took and and you know, I will I would say something on the baseball field, and I'd go, "Oh my gosh, that's your junior college coach." You know, that's Kenny <laughs> Richardson popping into your mind. Or that's Jerry Kendall. Uh, you know, that's something Jerry coach Kendall would do or, you know, or, you know, so yeah, I think you formulate your ideas and, and your demeanors a little bit from your, from your experiences. Absolutely. Um, um, but for some reason, you know, I, I, I just had that idea that I was going to coach and from a, from a, uh, a young age, I, I just always thought that that was going to be my career path and how lucky I was to be able to do it. Now let's not shortchange yourself. You did pitch for the Arizona Wildcats. You went seven and four with seven saves and you pitched in the 79 world series. Yeah. Matt, I'm I'm telling you, I, I, you know, I was a walk on. I was, (laughs) uh, I was happy to be at Arizona. I, I was a soft tossing right hander. So there's not many soft tossing right. And, and, uh, I had great, great teammates. I had great, great guys that protected me and, uh, uh, played very, 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 very well for me when I was pitching. What was uh, Omaha like in 1979? Um, it was, it was interesting because, you know, Rosenblatt, it wasn't as big a deal naturally as it is now, but it was still huge for us to, to, to make it. And Arizona had great tradition. They had won it in 76 and, and, um, this was 1979 and, and we had, we had just joined the PAC 10 mm-hmm. and UCLA had won the league. We came in second. The league was terrific because we were playing the, in, in the six pack at that time with, 
you know, Stanford, Cal, SC, UCLA, Arizona, Arizona State. So it was 30 games of just hard, tough-nosed baseball. Wow. And you, you think about those six coaches in that league at oh. that time were were just so good. And the teams were were so, you know, were really, really outstanding teams. And so you played 30 games and you were pretty well seasoned and yeah, we were able to host a regional in 79 and UCLA wasn't who had won the league because, you know, they, they played at Sawtell field, right. you know, the same mm-hmm. spot that the, it is today, but it was not very good. So they don't make it to the world series and we do. And um, so anyway, uh, uh, Omaha was, was, was pretty good. We, um, we we opened up with Miami and Craig Gleffords was our number one pitcher who pitched in the big leagues for a long mm-hmm. time. He threw a shutout. He he was terrific. Um, I think we won four six zero or something like that. And then we played Arkansas in the uh, winners bracket game. Yeah. And <laughs> um, so my memory was I I come into the game in the seventh inning, bases loaded. And we've got a one-run lead, and um, I can't remember who was up, but yeah, I walked the first guy on on ten, twelve pitches. He fouled a bunch off, three-two count, walk him, so it's tied. And then Kevin McReynolds, who, who played in the big leagues for a long time, hit a triple. We lost six-three, I think, or seven-three, or something. And you know, ten-three, but who's counting? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and. Uh, so anyway, my memories are, are not great. And then Fullerton <laughs> beat us the next day, um, um, you know, to eliminate us. And Fullerton went on to win it. That was Augie's, I think, first national champions. Uh, yeah. Um, but mean, the, that, the, the thing that I remember the most, and, and, you know, I don't remember the games very much, but um, – all the teams stayed in one hotel downtown Omaha, and and I've never really been able to figure it out. I think it was a Hilton downtown. It was a big, um, you know, 15, 18, 20-story building or something in Omaha. It had to be the biggest uh, uh, building there. But um, I, my roommate was Terry Francona, and Terry and Tim Wallach were really good friends. They had played summer ball together and, and USA teams together. So Tim would come up to our room every every day, and and Terry and Tim would wrestle around, and and Tim hurt his back. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows this, but he, you know, and he he played, but he hurt his back screwing around with Terry, and we laughed about that, and and uh, but anyway, that uh, that's one of the biggest memories I have is is. Tim coming up to our room and 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 them wrestling around and and screwing around and and I think Tim kind of tweaked his back a little bit. Oh Jesus, that could have thrown off the whole College World Series. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because they went on to win it, and I think he was yeah. Golden Spikes Player of the Year. Yeah. And I don't know. Right. If, yeah, they squeak. If I remember right, they squeaked out a win over Arkansas, like two one. But they did they? they? Yeah, they. But they came out of the losers bracket. Yeah. Yeah, that that College World Series was stacked with unbelievable teams. You guys, yeah. Texas, Mississippi State, uh, Fullerton, Pepperdine, Arkansas. Like it was loaded. Yeah, Miami. Like, yeah. good God, poor Connecticut got in. I don't know how the hell they got the College World but they, Series. They were good too, though, and and Maine might have gotten in. I know they got in the next year, but yeah. um, um, in fact, when Arizona won it the next year in nineteen eighty. Maine beat them the first game of the World Series. Wow. And, and Arizona came back through the loser's bracket to win that, uh, win it. But, um, yeah, there was always um, – but Connecticut – and I had played in the Cape in that uh, the summer before that, and the Cape wasn't anything like it is today. But <laughs> um, but there were a lot of good Connecticut players that, uh, in, the, in the league then. Does that – does that do you? I mean, you guys maybe do marvel at how it's changed with the when you played in the Cape then and what it is now. Like the just hundred and eighty degree change, yeah. Rosenblatt's the same way. It's yeah. your sport has grown leaps and bounds. Yeah, yeah, it really has, and and 
it, it's kind of fun to see. It's it's great to see naturally. Um, I wish the West would progress like the the South has done in baseball mm. um, a little bit more uh, um, as far as interest and in, in facilities. And I, I think the play is identical. I don't think the South has or the Southeast Conference is that much better than the Pac-12 is, you know, as far as players go. Right. But, but the interest and the and the um, national attention that they've created is terrific, is tremendous. Yeah. And, and I wish uh, out West, uh, you know, that we would do a little better job at that and, and have a little more commitment to it. Yeah. I mean, I love – college baseball. I think I can watch it more than major league baseball. I think it's some, right. of, the, some of the most interesting. I mean, I, I think coaches have way more of a, a control of the game at that level than they do in the major leagues. You know, there's bunting, there's hitting and running, there's steals. There's, there's real baseball to be played. It's old, it's old national league baseball to me when mm-hmm. I watch it. And, and I, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong. I think the biggest change is that kids are now willing, especially California kids, are willing to leave California and go to the South. Yeah, and, and but I, I I can't blame them if you if you play games in some of the parks and some of the areas in the SEC, oh, yeah. you understand why they're leaving. Uh, you know they're they're getting ten thousand people a game. Um, you know they're the players are rock stars in that in that. Uh, uh, community Mm -hmm. you know the nil money's uh you know getting better uh in the sec or is better in the sec than it is out west and um more exposure um tv wise i mean i don't know if you've been to the new facility at mississippi state but i would love to live there yeah (laughs) (laughs) that place is phenomenal Yeah. yeah it's it's you know and and most all most all of them. Uh, Arkansas has a beautiful stadium. LSU actually does. Oh, Texas A&M. Yeah, you know they're they're all but but they've they've created this and and it's and and, and it's it's so much more unique in those little small college towns than it is in L.A. or Seattle or um, Salt Lake City. There's just so much more for us to do here than to just go to the college game. I think and. And that hurts us out west as in in College Station, Texas. That's the only thing that goes on. And and those those kids are, you know, those families are are from the time they're born, they have maroon on and and, right. and they are going to every sporting event that they have and it's it's really unique in, in those small little towns and, and it's tremendous. It's, it's great to go play there and see the interest and see, um, you know, the, the, what the fans are doing and what schools are doing for this. And they, and they've built very beautiful, great stadiums. And so kids out West, you know, uh, you don't see that much uh, in the West and, and, um, you know, no, you you know little... this. You can go to a UCLA game on a Saturday night, and there might only be family and friends in the stands. That's it. But yeah. you can you can go to a Mississippi Mississippi State game, and that place is jam packed, yeah. and they've been cooking meat in the outfield and their burners <laughs> all day long, and you know kids are dressed up from head to toe in their you know Mississippi outfits, and it's a full on party out there. Yeah, but we played in the in the. Uh... Ole Miss Regional in 2016, and you know, we opened up with Ole Miss on on a Friday night or Thursday night, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I had to go to a meeting early in the morning, and it was you know nine o'clock in the morning. We were playing at seven, I think, and there were tailgaters all over <laughs> the campus already. And and you just went, oh my gosh, this is this is like football. Yeah, and. and uh, they treat it like football, and uh, uh, it, it, what a tremendous atmosphere it was that night, and, and uh, really cool to play in that deal. Did you beat them? Yeah, we won in extra innings and, and won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was maybe the most fun game I've ever been in because uh, I don't know if you've ever seen 
uh, a game there or or know their tradition. If Ole Miss hits a home run in in the right field section, that's all students, and they chain their their lawn, lawn chairs up and they sit sit out there. If Ole Miss hits a home run, they throw their beer up in the air and and. It's like a, a, a Vegas, sh- uh, you know, show, you know, where or, huh. um, it is like a fountain. And I was so happy. <laughs> I shouldn't say this. <laughs> they, they hit a home run in about the third inning with nobody on base. So it's just a solo home run. I was so happy to see that because, <laughs> it, you know, I've been kind of waiting for it. And it was unbelievable. The, the amount of beer that went up in the in, in the air. And and then the smell of it kind of ran right through the field into the dugout. I, I was kind of chuckling to myself. I said, "Oh my gosh, this is something else." But thank, thank God I didn't see any more. But you know, we won an extra inning, so it, it was a really sweet moment for me and, and our team to uh, win in that atmosphere. That see, that's the great baseball kind of experiences that you you don't get elsewhere you know they don't do that at arizona or seattle or you know in a a miami like regular major league baseball there's not that kind of overwhelming team experience yeah tell me about those four early years at utep because they must have been foundational for you to start building your career yeah you know jim lawler who um hired me um Tremendous guy, tremendous coach, a tremendous person. Um, I was really lucky to be under him. And, and he kind of taught me work ethic, I think. He was constantly on the phone, constantly recruiting, constantly, you know, doing things. He was a, he was a mover. He, he, he never stopped moving. And that kind of, you know, established, okay, this is how you have to be to, to – to uh, you know, run a program, and and so uh, those first four years were pretty interesting because, again, we went into a program that was you know not very good, mm-hmm. and and we we got competitive there, and 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 through recruiting, through through doing things, we got better players naturally, and 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 you know we were we were doing our best to to coach them and and to play, but. You know, we were playing San Diego State and Hawaii during their really good years, and we couldn't beat them. We we just weren't as good, uh, and, and couldn't couldn't beat them. But we got closer, and UTEP again was a was a uh, um, uh, they didn't have a field on campus. We, you know, we used the Double A Stadium uh, downtown. Oh. You know, we we would play games at eight o'clock in the morning in April and May because we had a doubleheader and the and the, Diab- the El Paso Diablos had a game that night, so we'd have to start at eight o'clock. Oh God! Uh, and and <laughs> you know, we we would it, it, here's another funny story. We would we would start hitting with the lights on because it was six in the morning when we get got to the field, Jesus. and. And and I tell people that I said, yeah, we, we would turn the lights off on to hit and then turn them off for the game. You know that that doesn't compute very much, and, and you know so there was a lot of roadblocks there. And then and then Jim took the pitching job at Texas A and M after the fourth year we were there, and luckily they gave me the job. Um, you know I was twenty seven years old, I think, and. 28 maybe and um they said bill you you can be the next head coach well i I didn't realize this at the time but you know they dropped the program the next year after after my first year as the head coach and that was probably in the works but nobody knew it other than the uh, you know the administration and and uh but thankfully I, i was able to do it and and we had we won 33 games that year and you know broke records in in uh um you know for the most wins in the school history and then they drop it and um was but that again bit, was that bittersweet to actually oh, it, it was very hard at the time because you know you thought okay you know i've i've started this coaching career and now you know hopefully i i can get another job you know and you, you know your first reaction was okay you you got to take care of your players and um um 
you know, so that was my first, you know, three weeks of after being told that of getting those kids settled in some place and, and getting them out and getting them, you know, in another program. And then you start thinking about yourself and then you, you go, okay, now what am I going to do? And, and luckily UTEP kept me on and, and still paid me, you know, for, they said they'd pay me for a year. And so I just kind of sat, the, I didn't have an opportunity to go anywhere. Um, maybe I interviewed for a job or two and, and didn't get them. Okay. And, and then, um, so all fall, I just kind of was an administrative assistant to the athletic director, which meant nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do anything. And, um, and then another funny deal, um, this was December of, of that year of, and the athletic director called me one morning. It was a Saturday morning. I'll never forget this. And he says, Hey, Bill, did you see the paper? And I said, yeah. He says, uh, you know, you saw that the Wyoming coach took the job at St. Mary's. So Jim Jones, who was the coach, took over at St. Mary's or just got the job. And so he was moving. And I said, why would I go to Wyoming? It's cold and it's, and we've been beating them, you know, every year that we've ever played them. And he said, Bill, you, you need to look at that job. You, you really need to, to take a look at it. They're interested in you and, you know, it keeps you going. And I said, well, I, I don't know. So anyway, I get a call from um, Gary Cunningham, the AD at, at uh, Wyoming and Gary was the ex, you know, assistant for John Wooden and um, at, at UCLA. And he was the athletic director at Wyoming at the time. And he invited me up for an interview and I went up and I really kind of liked it. What, um, did, what did you like? Well, the facilities were good. Okay. Um, it wasn't as cold as I thought at that time. It was December. They probably had uh, every heat lamp on in that city. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. And, um, I thought, okay, um, and I, I get back home, and they offer me the job, and I and I said, okay, can I can I take a day to you know think about this, or a little time? So I hang up the phone, and and I think about it, and I'm going, you know, why would I live in Laramie, Wyoming? And and so I called back to turn the job down. And the secretary answered the phone, and the guy that I was supposed to talk to was in a meeting. So I didn't, I didn't get a chance to turn the job down. And I walked up to my friend, uh, who was the strength and conditioning coach, Dan Viola, and I said, "Dan, I'm going to turn the job down." And he started screaming at me, basically telling me how dumb I was. It was a Division One baseball job. I have no job now, and he, he, he continued to say you got to take that job and, and was literally yelling at me and and I walked back to my office I called I, and I talked to the administrator I said I'm coming and I hung up the phone and I started crying <laughs> <laughs> and and you know again two weeks later I'm moving to Laramie Wyoming and uh and it was the best thing that I've ever done it was seven years of of really great learning experience for me. It was tremendous. Um, um, Did you become more with, of a, a head coach? You know, one yeah. year at UTEP's one thing. You're right. But right. Ab absolutely. And, and to, you know, you really learn about recruiting, trying to get kids to come to Laramie, Wyoming. And um, again, but I think the biggest influence there was I, I worked with some great people at, at, in Laramie. Um, Paul Roach became the athletic director, you know, a couple months after I was hired. And to this day, he was a football and uh, football coach and athletic director during that time. He's probably the greatest uh, person I've ever worked with or, or, or for. And he was tremendous. And the, um, football staff and the basketball staff. I mean, it was such a close knit uh, department. Um, we we had so much fun, and and, and you would did think so he, many you would think it would need to be right because you guys are all yeah. very much in that same boat. You know, you're not yeah. selling Miami or right. you know, sexy UCLA or on the beach. I mean, you guys are all like 
tight knit. Yeah. Got to be to you guys realize you don't have million dollar budgets just overflowing in your right. pocket. So you're in it together. Right. And the, and the people of Wyoming, and, and this is a really unique state, that was the only game in town. Yeah. So in, in, in the whole state, people traveled from, from uh, uh, eight hours for a basketball game and, and would drive home after the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was really unique. And um, we had good teams. Football team was going to the Holiday Bowls and, and went in the Mount West Championship or WAC at that time. Basketball went to Sweet 16 when I was there. Um, and, uh, um, we got pretty good. We got close to winning the whack in 1990. We were three outs away from winning it. And, and, uh, um, you know, so there were good teams there. There, it was good times and, and, uh, uh, and, and tremendous people. It was, it was fun to go to work every day. And, and, and during those times, recruiting was, was so much different at back, back then. You really didn't start recruiting till the, until the late summer, early fall, and JC, you, you go out to California and in Arizona, and and you know try to pick your guys, and and mm-hmm. and then you know high school re- recruiting was in Denver and in why and 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 in Wyoming, and and they don't have high school baseball in Wyoming, so it was all summer. So there wasn't the 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 time commitment to recruiting at that time, so. Every day we played golf and in the summertime, and then I'd go fishing at nighttime, and, and so it was a tremendous lifestyle, really. And, and um, we didn't have the money to, you know, to go to every game and and all that stuff. So it was it was fun and, and uh, enjoy, and I enjoyed uh, living there for the most part. The springs were a little bit tough, but uh, you know, summers were great and falls were great. Um, Winter got a little bit hard, but, yeah. but uh, um, now wait a minute. You breezed over something like it's just so natural. You're you're coaching in a state that doesn't have high school <laughs> baseball in the sport in which you're trying to participate in. My God, that sounds difficult. Yeah, and and, and that was part of the reason why I think in the end, you know. It, years uh, about four years after i left they dropped the program and and it was always a sticking point well why do we have baseball when we don't we don't play it in high school but the legion the legion programs around the state at that time and and they still are to this day are really strong and it's basically your high school team Mm -hmm. um and and they 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 would do a, a nice job they play 60 games in the in the in the summer and so there was a lot of there was a lot of baseball going on, uh, but it was just a little bit later than everybody else. They'd start in late May and 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 run through the first of August or so. Well, that first year you win the East. You're ten games above five hundred. You finish, you know, with over two hundred wins in that time in Wyoming. So you you really got a lot out of it during those time. Yeah, I I I, I, I yeah, me personally, I got a lot out of that. Um, um, and you know, it, it, it's interesting that 90 team is one of my favorite teams of all time. And, uh, like I said, we, we'd come within three outs of, of winning it. We were down at Fort Collins and, and playing the last game of the year. And if we won it, you know, we were whack champs mm-hmm. and, um, we had a three run lead and, and, two bloopers and a home run tied it and we lost it in extra innings. It's the most heartbreaking loss I've ever had. And, um, but that team has, has, is so close. We're still so close. We, we had a reunion two years ago, you know, there's those guys are the ones that text me if I have a big win or, or something, it's really something those, those guys are now, you know, in their fifties and, and, and families and college kids, you know, they're, they're right. going through that very successful people now. And, and it's just so fun for me to get together with those guys. And I mean, I've got a president of a university uh, in, in North Carolina uh, from that team and, and, you know, firemen and lawyers and, you know, just great people. And, and, 
and two guys in the big leagues um, hmm. that are coaching now. Ronnie Warner's a third base coach for um, for um, St. Louis, and and Rigo Beltran is the is the bench or um, the uh, bullpen coach for Cleveland. Hmm. You know, so you know all those guys have just been spectacular in their in their uh, what what they do and and. But they were great, great people and, and, and a great team. And that's one of the teams that, I, you know, I really cherish. Right. It, your sport, baseball, is probably of all of all the other sports. It's the one sport where a coach or a player can talk about a win or a loss and they can describe <laughs> the two bloopers, the, you know, the, the dying quail, like all these little things. And when, even when you said the talking, describing those three moments like there's nothing you can do you sit there wherever you are in that dugout and you're just you know a witness to these horrible events that you can't control i mean how did you do that throughout your your career as a coach like and understand like well there's nothing i could do it's it's a bloop single off a glove well that's still it's it's I've always said that baseball is a really cruel game. It, it, you know, it can be snatched out of your hands in a moment's time and you can lose a game that you have no business losing. You can lose to a team that you have no business losing to, but that's baseball. And um, it's hard. It's really hard. And as a college coach, you know, it, particularly over the last 15, 20 years, every game is important. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you, you wear it on your sleeve and, and, you know, the, the better coaches hide it. And it, at times it was really difficult to hide your emotions on your, on your, you know, inside you. And, you. and you take a lot home and thank God I had a great family and great wife and, and she handled me very, very well. Um, you know, so, but it, 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 it it's unique, uh, you know, baseball again like i said you know any team can beat anybody at any time if the right things happen or the wrong things happen and and you know you've been on both sides of it and you know the ones that 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 you're that you win that you shouldn't win you kind of say okay let's get off the field before they make us play another inning (laughs) Uh, and, and let's go home and hurry up, guys. Pack your bags. Let's go before they make us play again. And, and um, or you know that those ones that you really remember are the losses that you go, oh my gosh, how did that happen? You know, how did that ball bounce over the shortstop's head on the you know whatever it is? And and you just kind of you want to cry in your soup and and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and that happens at, at, at every level at, at, on every team. Now you mentioned her, your wife Janet. Is yeah. was she when you guys started dating? I mean, did you kind of explain like this is what I'm doing? I'm a baseball coach, <laughs> and did she kind of roll her eyes like, oh God? I mean, because being a wife of a baseball coach, I mean, she must be a really good bench coach, right? Well, she, she's got to deal it, with your wins and your losses, and for you when to bring them home and when not to be bringing them home. It, it, this is really kind of funny because she was not a sports person when, when we started dating and, and even when we got married, she didn't know much. She knew very little about baseball and, and not much sports. She was a, fl- a flight attendant for continental airlines back then. And, <laughs> and um, um <laughs> So when we, we got married, we moved right to Tucson, to University of Arizona, and and she would sit in the stands. And, you know, there were fans, a lot of fans there that had lots of opinions. And so when I would come home, she says, well, why don't you do this? Why didn't you do this? I said, where did you hear that? <laughs> well, up in the stands, I heard that. Well, that didn't go over so well early. So she learned real quickly really not to talk about the ins and outs of the game. Um, but, but, and then we started to have, and then we had our first child and that, that made it a lot easier for me because I had to come home and my son, Joe, he didn't care if we won or lost, you know, he was smiles and, you know, couldn't wait to, you know, get with dad. And so that made it 
for me so much easier and so much better to come home after a tough loss or, or, uh, you know, is that you have a family that cares about you and, and you have to care for and your, your, your perspective changes a little bit at that point, I think. And, and uh, so I, I was really blessed to have two great kids and, and a great wife. That's great that she's picking up people in the stands. Like, I can't believe yeah. he didn't do the double switch or he, yeah. Yeah. he, he yeah. didn't bunt that guy across. Yeah. That, that, that didn't go over so well when I, when, when it first started happening. <laughs> she's and, breaking uh, down your game. Yeah. 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 <laughs> From some drunk guy in the stands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's that's marvelous. You gotta you gotta love it. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I heard some guy yeah. named Kevin and Steve screaming about yeah. you for three hours. Yeah. Right. Oh man, I mean, you got. I mean, it's one of those things where I mean, you must have. I mean, all baseball players got have to have this short term memory loss, yeah. right? Because you can't live off of the last inning or the last play or. I mean, it's it's got to be one of those things where when did you start to feel like you could let things go in a game and move on mm-hmm. to the next inning? Boy, I had a tough time with that. And, and um, it, I, I had a really tough time with that. That was, And I talked to my son this, who's playing in college now who wants to be a coach. And, mm-hmm. and I, I talked to him about, you know, being able to separate that. And, and I was not good at it particularly early. I don't know if I was ever very good at it. Um, and, and you have to be able to do that. It's not like football where you play once a week, you're playing four games a week. And, you know, if you're playing three games and you lose a tough one on Friday, you got to bounce back on Saturday and make sure that, that you as a, as a head coach or the pitching coach or whatever are, are, is ready to play because, you know, your team's going to feed off that. And, at times I was not good at that. And, and, and that's something that, um, as I got older, I realized it and, um, and, and tried to work on that a little bit. And, um, I spent two years with the White Sox, uh, in the minor leagues and mm-hmm. that kind of helped me a little bit because we were playing every night then. And, you know, I, I, I um, uh, you know, the, the, the manager of that team, uh, you know, once sat me down and says, Hey, it's not a big deal if we we lose on Thursday night. We got Friday night, you know. So, so that kind of that kind of helped me a little bit too um, uh, to realize, you know, you got to bounce back, and it's not, you know, you can't take it so hard, and, and because there's always a, a, the next game, right? And, but but also I, I also learned this when I when I went to Arizona State. I left Wyoming and went to Arizona State and, and worked with the legendary Jim Brock. Mm-hmm. Um, I also learned this one at that time where, you know, now we are at high stakes baseball, at, you know, at, at Arizona State. It, every game was important that you won and you were expected to win. And we had great teams, you know, for, for the two years I was there great teams and we went to world series both years all that was great but boy you learn that it's the next game you'd win and you go okay i got tomorrow i got to get prepared for tomorrow or if you lost you go oh boy do i really have to get prepared for tomorrow um you know so there was a little different deal there where the pressures of of winning and losing really had an effect on me there where you learned, you know, you, you can't get too high and, and you better not get too low because uh, there's a next one and you better be prepared. And, and Jim really taught that. And he was, he was tough. Right. Uh, and it's interesting too, because you're not playing. You're just trying to, at that time, right? You're at Arizona state. You're a pitching coach. You're just trying to yeah. control that one guy on the bump. <clears throat> Yep. So it's not even you taking it personal, like, oh, I missed the zone. I can't believe I'm not pounding this damn thing. It's your list sitting there going, why isn't that kid pounding the damn zone? I'm calling inside right. and he's throwing outside. But I think pitching coaches, you know, and we, we got, that was kind of the era where we started calling pitches and we were, 
involved in the game plan much, much, much more than we had been before. And, or, and, and now when you're, when you're calling pitches, you're kind of pitching. Right. And so that there's a little bit different mindset. And I, and I think pitching coaches go through that. They're, they're actually pitching for that guy, you know, and, and, and that was, that was something that I had to get, get, over two was, you know, if I gave up a home run or if I'm the pitching coach and I call a pitch that got hit for a home run, man, I had to get ready for the next pitch just like a pitcher did. And, right. um, you know, so the mental game, which was introduced to me by our good friend, Mike, Mike Weathers, you know, became really important as a coach as well as a player. Mm-hmm. Now, but, how was that transformation for you from going to head coach at Wyoming to pitching coach at Arizona State, but then the stakes get higher because it's a, a different quality of baseball. Yeah. Well, um, that was a funny, funny story too. And in, in the fact that me being a wildcat going to Arizona State, <laughs> um, that's the first thing that we got to get over is that, um, and, and Coach Brock had called me when they had an opening and, and we had played Arizona State you know, a couple times and, and when I was at Wyoming and, you know, we had good clubs in 89 and 90 and competed pretty well for them. And so he remembered that. And um, so when he called and asked if I would be interested, I kind of laughed. I said, I, I don't think so. I can't go be a sun devil. I don't think that's right. But um, the intrigue of, of being at a prestigious baseball school and have a chance to win a national championship and, and all those things that it, it was, and, and get back to Arizona. Um, it, it was just too much of an opportunity for me. And, and so I welcome that. It, it was, um, you know, I always say this, it was a, it was the most exciting two years of, of my coaching career because we were so good. Um, but it, man, it was hard. It was really hard. Um, coach Brock was a demanding, demanding coach and on his players and, and on his coaches. But I learned so much um, those two years about organization and, um, um, you know, what it takes to run a top, you know, program. Um, and, and so it, it was, it was kind of thrilling, but the thing that was the most interesting part of that is when, after I hung up the phone with coach Brock, I had to call, call coach Kendall and ask for his blessing because, you know, coach was my hero and, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a wildcat and, 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 and Jerry Stitt was the assistant at that time. And he was a really close friend of mine and he had coached me my senior year and, and coach wing. And, and those are, those are my heroes. And, and um, so I called coach Kendall and he says, Oh, Bill, that's a great opportunity. You know, you've got my blessing. Well, I called Jerry Stitt and I said, I said, coach, guess who called me today? And he goes, no, (laughs) you can't do that. And so it was tough. It, that was, that part of it was tough is, you know, the Sun Devils never really trusted me and, and the Wildcats were mad at me. So it, it was, it was a, a little bit of a tough two years in that, that, that uh, realm. But, but my God, it's not the civil war. It's so- it, it, it is there though. And, and you, you understand that yeah. and, and people, you know, it's it, like up here at Utah, you know, you'd never want to coach at BYU, but, if you do, you know, it's, it, it, I, I did it. I was a trader and, and, <laughs> but, but it was it, the other thing I tell people, and this is honest to God truth. I, I didn't put anything on with ASU until I got my first paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never put a hat on. I never put on a, a, a shirt with ASU until I got my first paycheck and then I was fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but, but anyway, um, those two years were, were really an exciting time, but it, it was really tough. It was, it was demanding. And, and again, you, you take things and you learn things, you know, along your career. So it was tremendous two years for me and my growth. I was going to say that that must've been some big building blocks for you, for your yeah. next step moving forward. Absolutely. Um, you know, I learned things 
organizational practice plans, organizational. Coach Brock, Brock was an unbelievable organizer with everything. I mean, he was tremendous in that. I wouldn't call him a great baseball person. Uh, you know, or baseball, you know, he didn't know the mechanics of a swing or anything right. like an expert, but man, could he manipulate people and, and um, organize, uh, you know, success. It, he was, he was tremendous in that. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you get people like that, right? He's like McCarthy. Yeah. He just knows how to yeah. get his soldiers in place. And then he lets yeah. his Lieutenant colonels, you know, do the yeah. rest. Yeah. And, that, and he had great, he had great coaches around. I'll, I'll always right and, and yeah. right and is that was yeah. that something you learned if next time I become a head coach I got to make sure right. I got better captains yeah. to I, coach my kids absolutely you try you try to do that yeah yeah and you know I've always had great people that that worked for me yeah uh, or that were my assistant coaches and and you have to because um f- for success th- those are the guys that are really kind of doing it right because as as you know, the head coach has, and it's even, it's, I mean, you're from your time at UTEP to your final time at Utah, like what a head coach used to do in 1985 <laughs> to what he finally ended up doing, right? In, in 21, right. night and day. I mean, yeah. your, your expectations and your things that you had put on your plate were completely different over those 30 years. Absolutely. Um in fact, the last few years, you, you didn't feel like you were coaching anymore. You were doing everything else but coaching. Right. Good God. That must yeah. Have, yeah. Massive, massive things that people have no idea what you have to do at the most recently in your career. I'm sure when you started in your Wyoming, you're like, I just got baseball. That's yeah. it. Right. No TV show, no radio, no this, no right. that. You know, I'm just, you know, a baseball coach in Wyoming. Right. That must have been that must have been pleasant. So after your two years at Arizona State, you move on, and it's and you kind of what? Don't you come back home to Arizona? Well, what happened was Coach Brock died. That that uh, my um, he he contacted or he got cancer. Right. Struggled that that whole second year that I was there in 1994 and died the Sunday night after the championship game of the world series. Um, you know, so he was really sick that whole year and that whole uh, semester. And then towards the end, you know, he wasn't around much and he, he was so sick and we got home from Omaha and, and he had gone home early cause they, they flew him home because he, he just wasn't able to sustain. But anyway, um, so he dies that Sunday and, and, um, uh, early in June. And, and so, you know, we're all on pins and needles. Of what's going to happen at Arizona state. And, you know, they hire Pat Murphy and, and I'm basically out of a job in, in September. Um, they did the hiring late and, and there weren't any jobs available. So I'm out and, um, you know, they, they pay me that, for a little bit. What is that like knowing that you have well, no control? Yeah, it was disheartening because you were, um, you know, you'd just been to the World Series twice and, and, you know, you thought you'd done a really good job. Now, I look back and, and you know, I, I wasn't ready to be the head coach there uh, by any means and, and um, didn't think that that would be, but you were hoping to stay on as an assistant coach. Well, as you learn, you know, your, your head coaches have to have your, your own guys. And, and so, you know, as time went on, you really realized that Pat made the right decision, bringing in his own guys and making sure that, you know, he had his own, own people on board. And so you, you understand it now, back then you probably didn't, you were bitter and you were, you know, wishing you were still working. Mm-hmm. So I sat out for, for a year and um, didn't do a whole lot. And that was a tough year because you, again, you're going back to, you know, time when you got dropped at UTEP, you go, okay, do I, do I get a chance to get back in? And, and luckily, or well, again, you know, you go through things and, and 
Rick Sofield was a coach at University of Utah, and, and at Christmas time, he took a job in professional baseball with the Montreal Expos. And so that opened a job up in, in this area in, or in the West. And so I started working on that during the, during the spring. And, and luckily they, they, or, you know, I, I got the job in, in May for the fall, you know, for the 96 season, I guess it was, or 95, 96 season, I mm-hmm. think. And, um, I came up here and brought Tim Isme, who was my, uh, our volunteer coach at, at Arizona State and played at Arizona State and great guy, great coach. And we both came up and, you know, really had a, a, a fun year, good year. Well, that was the year Coach Kendall retired at Arizona and Jerry Stitt got the job. And being close friends with Jerry, we had talked about, you know, for years about the opportunity of maybe coaching together. And so, again, that opportunity came up for me to go to Arizona and be the pitching coach and, and associate head coach and get back home and thinking, okay, this is my last stop. I'm going to be here for a long time. And uh, so I, I only stayed up here one year and, um, and, uh, and then moved to Tucson. And uh, so that journey began, (laughs) Uh, you know, so, um, did you have no and, problem and, and, immediately putting on wildcat clothes? No, that, that, that was, <laughs> that was, a, that was really a, a pride, a prideful deal for me to, to be able to put that uniform back on and, and, um, and be a part of that department and, and, and be there and, and live in Tucson. We, Jan and I had just gotten married and, and, uh, so it was kind of a perfect, uh, spot for us to start for me to start over and, and for us to start together in Tucson and a place that I love and, and um, um, so we, we started our journey at, at, at Arizona Yeah, it was five years there, correct? Yeah, and um, <laughs> again, you know you, you, you think everything's going to be great and we had some good years and we had um you know, our, our last year was not very good. We had a lot of injuries. Uh, we were young and, um, um, we, and, and coach did got let go. And, and again, you're, you go, Oh my gosh, I'm out of a job again. I'm married. I've got two kids or, you know, I've got two kids and I'm going, Oh my gosh, now what? Um, <laughs> and, and you're, and you're kind of sitting back again and you're bitter again, but you, you look back at it and, you go again, that, that was a learning point for me. And I, and I was lucky that again, I was very lucky that, you know, a job came open with the white Sox and that fit my, fit me perfect. And I, and I worked for them for two years. And again, it was great education for me and, um, you know, being in the minor leagues with great people, great coaches and, and, um, uh, some really good players that, that I saw. And, uh, and in a you know a little different perspective, and I really enjoyed the heck out of that. It was two years of of really all you thought about was baseball or pitching for me, and and it was it was good. Uh, I did I had to write a report after every every game or every practice, and that was about it. You know, you went home, you didn't have to recruit, you didn't have to worry about uh, uh, you know people flunking out of school or or not getting their grades or not going to class or. Um, it, it was pretty nice. I enjoyed it. How was that dealing with, you know, quote unquote men, right? Now you're dealing with grown men or at least 25 year old men. Well, I, I was with the young guys. So I was dealing with kids out of high school and out of one or two years out of junior college. So it's the oh, same thing. Oh, same thing. I, Just I no education. The, yeah. I, I was with the young guys. I was with, you know, I, I did extended spring training and then went to Bristol, Virginia for two years um, okay. in the Appy, in the Appy League. And um, it was great because spring training at that time was in Tucson. So I just stayed home where, you know, everybody else on the staff had to come find places to live and mm-hmm. be away from their family. So I was never away from my family. It was a perfect situation, p- professional uh, baseball wise for a coach is that I lived in Tucson. Spring training was there extended spring training, which, you know, was, was fine. You know, I didn't mind it cause I got to go home every day at three o'clock and, and, um, uh, and then went to Bristol, Virginia for two years uh, or two summers 
and for two two and a half months and get out of the heat of Tucson. So it worked out pretty good. And then you're off for for six months. Wow. And uh, it, it was a pretty good life, uh, other than not getting paid a whole lot. And and uh, <laughs> but but it was it was uh, it, it was a pretty good life. And um, again, you learn and you you uh, you know you you experience things that uh, help you with the next job that you get. Now, are you? constantly keeping your feelers out and talking to people like, Hey, is anybody moving? You got a job opening? What's happening? Or, you know, yeah, during that time I, I sure was. And, and here was my, my thought process was that, you know, and is that you start looking at your future and you, you start looking at retirement a little bit and mm-hmm. you, you go, I've got a lot of years in college baseball with a retirement system. And, and, you know, that I put a lot of money into, you know, that, I, I probably need to get back to that at some point to finish that off. And, and so, yeah, I, um, I think I had a, I had an interview, uh, at Wake Forest and almost took that job and, and, um, almost left to go to Wake Forest as a pitching coach and didn't do it. And then, and then luckily again, the Utah job came open and the same athletic director hired me again, which uh, I, I, again, being lucky in the right time, Tim Esme had, you know, taken over for me at, at, from being my assistant to taking over and had eight, eight years up here. And, and then he got a job at Arizona state at his alma mater. And, and this job came open and, and they called me and said, would you be interested in coming back? I said, heck yes. <laughs> um, because I had enjoyed that, that first year here so much. Um, I said, yep. And I'm not leaving again. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay and I'm going to, I'm going to try to do something there. And, and, uh, was that really your mindset? Like they're going to have to yeah. rip this uniform off me a- kind of. A- absolutely. I'd moved around enough. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want, I, I didn't pursue anything, um, um, during, during those years. And, um, I was, again, you, you, you go back to luck and, and I, my, my, my boys were four and two when we moved here. They went through one school district, um, their whole, uh, life. Now they're in, now they're in college. So they, they went to one school district there and lived in the same house for, you know, 18 years and, and through, through high school. So that doesn't happen with coaches a whole lot. No. So I, I feel r- really good about that part of it. And for me, staying here was, and we love Salt Lake. It's a beautiful place to live. It's a great place to live. And, uh, you know, we, I always thought I'd go back to Tucson after I retired. And, and we still might at some point. But at, at this point, we, we have no desire to leave Salt Lake and, and, uh, and remain here. So those 17 year seasons were, were good and bad. And, and <laughs> we had some good ones. We had some bad ones, but uh, it, it, it was, you know, we love being here and we love the university of Utah and, and uh, we'll always, we'll always, I'll always be a Ute. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you get there and it's a West coast conference. And then in 2012, you join the PAC 12 <laughs> Yeah. I mean, did you did you start to hear those rumblings that we might be moving at some point around 09, 10, 11 that there would be a change? No. no. We heard nothing up here. That was a, such a well-kept secret uh within our administration. Um and Chris Hill who had, who had longtime athletic director here did that in complete silence. I, I'm sure the football and maybe the basketball coach knew some things, but I sure didn't. And, and you know, we had had okay teams or pretty good teams in the, in the Mountain West, and, but not, not, not great teams at all. We'd kind of won regional. And, <clears throat> and he, I'll never forget the day he walked into my office and, it, it, you know, the, we had had the announcement the day before and Chris Hill walks into my office and he goes, are you breathing? Okay. And, and because 
he knew that I'd been in the Pac-10, now the Pac-12, and what I was up against. Mm-hmm. And and he, he he just says, "Hang in there, you know. We'll 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 up the budget. We'll we'll get going on things, but it's going to take a while. So just hang in there for a little bit. We know what we're getting into, and and they really didn't know what we were getting into for baseball because nobody up there had had seen back." 10 baseball at that time and how good it was just you you're the only one with yeah, real eyes i'm on. the only one that that really really knew what we were getting into and so but are you terrified hand, uh, yeah, a little bit and but on the other hand it was exciting because all of a sudden now we're in a conference that cares about baseball yeah and and we're going to have to start caring about baseball if we want to do it. And so that was the exciting thing for me. Our budgets were going up. Our our, our um, visibility was going up. Our, our relevance was going up. And so that, that kind of renewed me a little bit. In fact, okay, we've got a heck of a challenge here, guys. Let's see if we can do this. And, um, you know, I had young assistant coaches and, and – um, you know, I said, okay, start, you know, get your summers together because you're, you're not going to be home. Tell your, kiss your wife's goodbye because <laughs> um, we got to get on the road. And, and um, you know, the statement from me was, okay, are you recruiting Mount West players or Pac-12, Pac-12 players? And, you know, it, it it's hard. Again, you know, you're, you're trying to get in that pool of Pac-12 players um, and you're battling the other. 10 teams in the league and it's tough um, yeah. when you're a new program. But um, So when the AD says to you, hey, we're going to increase your budget, tell me what does that mean? Does that mean you're going to be giving more budget to go recruit kids, more time yeah. out, or are they going to give you more money to up your assistant coaches, payroll, so, you know, God forbid, you know, when times happen, you could pay a guy a little bit more money yeah. and bring in a better guy. Where does that money get spent to kind of help you compete now with teams that are spending it already? Well, the recruiting budget went up a little bit, you know, they, they didn't do it. You know, they, he had an incremental plan, you know, first to get football and basketball up to standard. So mm-hmm. that a lot of that money went there. Now football was already in a really good position at that point, but they had to build some facilities, um, you know, facility for football, practice facility, office, you know, all those things that, you know, the, a program now needs. They had to get a basketball facility, a practice facility for, for, for basketball. So the, the non-revenue sports were a little bit on second tier on, on the in there. So it t- took some time. Our, you know, recruiting budget went up. Travel budget went up a little bit. Um, and they had a philosophy is, you know, you have to prove to get your salaries up, you know, so you have to win a little bit before we're going to adjust your salary. So that, that was a little, little, uh, not disheartening. You understood. I mean, what, right. um, was, was getting more dollars going to make more wins at, at that point? Probably not. Uh, but it, but again, it was, it was the, the system that, that we were in and, and, you know, we had a change in coaching staffs at, from time to time. And, you know, every time you hired a new coach, you got a little bit more money and a little bit more money and stuff like that. But uh, it, it, it was never until we won in, in 2016, the, the salary structure was, was still Mount west mm-hmm. I guess you could call it instead of pac Ten-ish, right or Pac twelve ish, and and um, um, but we, you know, again, you're in the coaching business, and and salaries have got really kind of out of hand, in my opinion. But um, 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 you know, we were able to live and have a house and have a roof over our heads and eat very well and raise two kids and put them through Catholic school, and so I, I thought my life was pretty good. Yeah, I mean it's. It's interesting, a person we both know, George Horton, when he left Fullerton and went to Oregon, that was kind of where baseball's salaries kind of changed yep. because 
his salary, and he sat a year, right? They were still building that program. It, like, yeah. tripled. I yeah. remember when he was going to leave the job, the AD, Brian at the time said, go. Like, we can't, we can't do that. It's not within right. our budget. We, we're a state school, and we're, we're stuck at a structure. Since then, baseball salaries have gone up, but, like, football salaries are through the roof. Yeah. I mean, there was at a point Nick Saban was making more money as the football coach than Cal State Fullerton's total athletic budget. Yeah. And, and I have a hard time with that, but but I, I don't know if anybody's really worth all that, but I guess they are in in, in terms of wins and losses and and, and all that. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, but it's, it, again, it's a sign of the times where baseball has grown, um, and particularly in the South, you know those coaches are making a great salary now, and yeah. but they're but you know when you when you make that kind of money, you got to win, and mm-hmm. and um, so there's the added pressure, and everybody everybody always says, "Well, you're making a million dollars, you can you know if you lose your job, you still got." No, that's not the way it is. It, you know, p- people have a lot of pride in what they do, and and um, doesn't matter how much money you make. It, it, uh, you know, you, you want to be successful, but, but anyway, uh, it, it's been good in the fact that people are, are, are doing very well financially now and assistant coaches are being paid yes. what they're worth. And, and, uh, um, so, so it's, it's all good. I, you know, the old coaches like just me and the, and guys that are retired now are, are just like the players in the M- MLB are, you know, we're, we're Man, I wish we would have gotten that kind of money. <laughs> it's all relative. It's all relative. Yeah. Now, those first four years for you in the Pac-12, you struggled, right? You finished 11th place. Yeah. But something yeah. clicked for you in 16. You guys, you guys win the Pac-12. Like, what yeah. What was it for you? What got you guys going? Well, there, there was a couple things. Number one, those kids have been together for four years and, and – it was kind of our first recruiting class in the in the pack when we got back our first two years okay and they had gone through the struggles of it and the year prior to in 15 um we we really had a pretty good year it, it, the record doesn't indicate it uh or our wins and losses that didn't rec- uh but we were we were in so many games that year and lost, you know, like eight games by one run or two runs in the Pac-12. And and you just felt like you were that close. You, you, we just needed another piece or two, some more depth um, in the pitching staff, um, mm-hmm. you know, another another really good player to add to these guys. And we, we would be pretty good. The other thing that happened is I is I had a, a, a new assistant coach come in, a new offensive coach, um, by the name of Jason Hawkins, who came in and and really kind of changed our our uh, or brought in a lot of new things that were really good, and he um, he helped us tremendously. And but anyway, that team we had great expectations for our team in 16. And I, and I think we, as a coaching staff, we knew that we had a chance to be pretty good and, and had a chance to, to be much better. Um, we had a veteran group and we had a couple freshmen and JC, maybe a JC guy or two coming in that were really going to help us and add depth to us. And, um, but we started that season two and 13 or something, we, we, we got off to the worst start. And as a coach and as a staff, we put so much pressure on, on our guys because we thought we had to be good mm-hmm. and we worked them to death and we were, we were hard on them and they just didn't respond like they should have. And we, we play and, and we, we had a Tuesday night game at BYU and they beat us six to zero. And we were listless. We we, and I'm looking out at them, and I'm just, uh, you know, these good guys and good players were just not having any fun. And I, I basically stayed up all night thinking about this. I got to the office very early, 
Jason and I sat down and I said, Jason, we got to change. We got to change something now because we're not, we're not doing it and us. We're not doing it right. And so we had a little bit of a team meeting and basically the guys got it off their chest, what was going on. And, and we, as a coaching staff, relaxed a little bit on our pressure on them. Hmm. And all of a sudden, they and I'll never forget this. It was a Wednesday's practice, and it was the best practice I've ever had. And they were full of energy. They were smiling again. And we, we, uh, we left for Oregon that next day, and we went to F3 at, at University of Oregon. We, we beat George two out of three. And come back, have a week of practice, everything's good. We go to Arizona State, went two or three there. And all of a sudden we said, and the guys just said, we're going to win this thing. And I'm going, guys, come on, slow down. we got a long ways to go. No, coach, we're winning this thing. And we battled and played our asses off for the next nine weeks, eight weeks. And and just played as hard and as good as we possibly could do on the weekends. And then on every Tuesday, we had nothing left. It was uh, UVU swept us. BYU beat us to it. I think we split. We couldn't win a Tuesday game to save our life. But we won, <laughs> we won every Friday and we won every Sunday. And, and um, we had a great uh, – uh, Josh Rose was – or Jason Rose was our – uh, Friday night pitcher. He was tremendous. He was a Pac-12 pitch of the year. He was tremendous. Gave us seven innings every Friday night. Gave us a chance to win. We had a closer by the name of Dylan Drackler that was really good. And and um, we had an offense that was relentless. And those guys just played so hard and so passionately. Um, and <laughs> I shouldn't say this at all. The pack was down a little bit. And what happened, some key players on some teams got hurt. Uh, Cal lost their number one pitcher. Arizona State lost a couple guys. UCLA was down that year, the only year that they've ever been down. Stanford was down that year. So we took advantage of that. And, um, you know, we come back from Arizona State. We have Arizona here. We sweep them at home. We win a game, we're down four in the bottom of the ninth, and we score five. It was just one of those years where, you know, things went right for us. And, um, you know, if we lost, it didn't matter. We came back the next day. We were nine and one on Sundays. And, um, wow, I, the, the, in the pack. And that that's what, what got us to the, to the chance to play Washington at the end of the year because uh, they were – Basic. We were basically even going into the last series of the year. We were at home. They beat us on Friday. We win on Saturday. We come back, and then we just pummeled them on Sunday for the championship. <laughs> and, and you know, it was the greatest, greatest. Uh, I think one of the greatest stories in in college baseball, particularly that year. That you know, this team that had finished last for four straight years, or Close to last, I think, yeah. and all of a sudden wins, you know, one of the best leagues in the in the in the country, or if not the best league. And and we weren't the best team; we we just played the best, or we weren't the most talented team. And and on that, you know, another thing on that, not to put anything down, but SC SC had thirteen guys drafted off that off their sixteen club. We oh, had one. Jesus, criminy. So. Um, it was a gritty group that band together and just was determined not to lose. Right. And, and they went 10 weeks or 11 weeks, 10 weeks of, of playing as hard as they possibly could. And they did it. Well, you know, this, you've been around long enough. Sometimes great players don't make a great team. You've got to have depth you got to have everybody pulling in the same direction. You don't need a bunch of distraction. You got to have chemistry. That matters. Yeah, and and the other thing is we didn't have injuries. We had some, but we overcame, and and guys played through them. And 
you know, our pitching staff stayed intact. We didn't lose anybody there. Um, our little second baseman, Cody Davis, who's a tough, tough nut, separated his shoulder probably eight times during that year, but he would put it back in and finish the game, you know, and, and maybe not practice on Tuesday or Wednesday, but he would be ready for Friday. And, um, you know, we had guys like that. Uh, you know, Dallas Carroll played third base, which is great. Cody Skajari was our shortstop, had a monster year offensively. Um, we had a guy, Deshaun Kiersey, who came in as a freshman, played center field, you know, was a fourth-round pick later on. With So we had good players. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and Jason Rose, pitcher of the year. You know, it, 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 we did have good players. Don't, don't get me wrong. Sure. But, man, did, they, they were just gritty and tough. And – and wanted something so bad that, and and they did it. Can you talk about injuries? Because I've always wondered what's going through <clears throat> a coach's mind. Because there you are, you're in the dugout, and you see a kid go down, a knee, a shoulder, or this, that, and like. How do you keep your composure? Like those are your kids. You yeah. got a million things going through your head. Like, oh, who's going to replace him? What are we going to do? How yeah. bad is it? Like, and when did that start to get? I guess you get better at it because you might have been a wreck early in your career when it happens, but you know, are you better at the end of your career handling <laughs> watching the injury? No, no, I don't think it ever gets any easier because you know, not only are is it hurting your chances of of having a su- successful year, it's really hurting that kid and and the and the and the pain that he goes through. Not not pain of being injured just the pain of not being able to participate uh through rehab and 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 sitting out you know the guys that have tommy john it's hard Mm. on them mentally it's really hard because they know for a year that they're not going to compete and they have to sit back and they have to do their rehab which is constant and then go to the ballpark and watch their teammates play and they can't help them and mentally, that's a that's a tough, tough deal on them. And those are the things that you worry about more than uh, maybe, you know, oh, gosh, now, now we have to play this guy or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. it's an opportunity for somebody else. But, <clears throat> but, you know, it's sure tough on those kids when they, when they, you know, want to be out there and, and can't be. It's, it's tough on them. Right. I mean, it's... Uh... I've always wondered what's going through your guys' head because it's just a, it's a heartbreaking thing to watch the the kid go through. But then the 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 coach who's got to deal with this horrible situation, you're just gonna like, oh god, that's got to be hard. That's got to be hard. Yeah. yeah, you've been around long enough where you've seen some very very interesting rule changes in baseball mm. from the the seams on the ball, the bats changing immensely. Was there ever changes in baseball you shook your head out and said, you fools, why are you doing this? Or, you fools, why didn't you do it sooner? Well, you mentioned a couple of things. You know, the, I think the bat change has been a, a, a positive deal. Um, you know, uh, the, the seems like pro- probably a really good thing on the baseballs. Um, you know, the... the the, the thing that we're going through now, um, I'm, I'm all in favor of speeding up the game. Mm. And, and I, I love the 90 second rule in between innings, um, 20 seconds, you know, in between pitches. I'm not in a, in a, I'm still kind of wavering on this one right now is, is I don't particularly like, using the clock with a man on base, I think it's taking away a little bit of baseball strategy, um, the way baseball is played, because there's no time, there's not as much time to, to give signals offensively. We've changed the way that we're doing that. Okay. Is that good? I don't know. You know, I, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a big guy for offensive cards and yelling out a number. I don't like that, uh, so to say, but I'm, I'm sure that's the only way to do it now because giving hand signs like we 
we done forever <laughs> with part of the game. And, um, you know, and people say, well, you know, you could get those stolen. Well, yeah, you can. And that's part of the game. Right. Like getting your sign stolen. That's part of the strategy. And, the, the, you know, part of winning a game is maybe picking the coach's signs. I, I you know, I always thought that was a thing that, that was 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 a good thing. If you were able to do that, you, you should be able to exploit it. Um, I'm not at all suggesting that that uh, cameras and and technology should enter into that. I'm right, not right, at all. Yeah. I'm I, I'm not. I'm totally against that. But if you've got bad hand signals and some you know yeah. guy yeah. can read them, yeah, I, I think you should be able to exploit that. Um, so I I, I I'm kind of watching the college game just to see if that. You know the twenty second clock with runners on base, how much that is in influencing influencing the the, the game um, as a coach. Is and now that I think about it, uh, I wouldn't like that part of it. I think I like all the other stuff that's that's going on. Um, I think most of the rules that have changed over the years are are probably positive and and. Uh, are, are helping, helping the game. You know, the slap rules is, is good, you know, staying away from injuries, um, uh, hit by batters, you know, that's something that is subjective. And I think some umpires get it right and some don't, but, mm -hmm. um, but other than that, you know, the, the big one is, it is this clock stuff. And we're going to see a lot of it in professional baseball now. And, and that's going to be a, a point uh, of, of contention all summer, I think, or all spring and summer and into the fall. And we'll see what Major League Baseball does on that and see if they make any changes. I think they'll go through the year and probably change something on that. Right. Who was the best <coughs> baseball player you ever coached against? Hmm. <clears throat> well, there's a bunch of them. The guy that comes to mind as a baseball player, the pure baseball player, um, the Madrigal kid at Oregon State was fantastic. Okay. He was just a baseball player. Um, he could hit. He could field. He had a, a another instinct that players didn't have, and you could see it right off the bat. He would be in play. You go. He'd be in places, and after the play, you'd go. How did he get there? How did he know how to be there? And he, he was fantastic at that. Um, uh, there, there, there are just so many of them. Um, uh, another kid at University of Arizona was kind of the same way. Mejia um, mm -hmm. w was really good. Shortstop leader. Um, what's his name at Irvine? Uh, the coach there now. Ben? Um, ben Orlock? Ben, ben, Benny was great to watch. I loved watching him play. Um, you know, pitching, pitching wise, um, um, Mark, um, um, he's a pitching coach at, with the Dodgers now. Oh yeah. Um, uh, pr uh, Mark, Mark Pryor. Pryor. Yeah. Uh, he, he pitched against us when I was at Arizona. He struck us out 60, 16 times and threw like 93 pitches that game. He didn't throw a, a ball till the sixth inning of, the, of that game. Did not throw one ball. Jesus, he was, was good. Like, yeah, he was really good that that junior year of his. Uh, the, the best hitter I think I've ever seen is, is a guy I played against, Bobby Horner. Oh was, yeah, was was unbelievable when he'd come up to the plate. He was he was ter terrific. Um, you know, I played with some really good ones. Uh, Terry Francona was a terrific baseball player, he, terrific hitter. Um, there, there are just so many of them. I, I, I don't know. Best, yeah. Uh, the best hitters I've had. You know, I had C.J. Crone uh, here. He, he was unbelievable as a hitter, and I compared him to Paul LaDuca when I coached at Arizona State. <laughs> <clears throat> they both had such great hand-eye coordination. They never missed, and to their detriment at times, they never missed. Uh, ball would be four feet outside, and still hit. <laughs> and and um, 
but CJ was probably the best player to come out of Utah uh, ever. Um, fantastic player, fantastic hitter. Yeah, I loved that kid. I had him when I was uh, with the Angels organization. He was fantastic. Yeah. Did you ever rub elbows with Rick Majerus during your first stint at Utah? <laughs> Um, Rick was a little different. Now you, you talk about a, a great coach. You talk of, you talk to players that played for him now, um, and they love the man. They thought he was one of the greatest coaches ever, and he was. He didn't care about anything else but basketball, and was was terrific in what he did. He was not a personable guy. I and mean, the the only real interaction in my my office was. 20 feet from him. I don't think I ever talked to him. I don't think. In <laughs> fact, I, I took an, I took an NCA test at the same desk with him. It was just he and I, cause we had missed it. We must've been on the road or something. And so we, we, it was just he and I in a room doing the NCA test and he never acknowledged me. So that was the kind of guy that he was. He, he there, there are a lot of stories about him and, and how, he react how he acted up here, but man, he, he was some kind of coach. He, he I, I got, I had to do a day in a life with him. And that is a different drummer. What's ever going on in his head at that time was a different drummer. My God, yeah. he was an interesting fella. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever that drum was going in his head though, it worked for him while he was at Utah. Donnie Daniels was a long time assistant for him. Yes. Donnie, you know, Donnie was at Fullerton. Donnie was at UCLA and in Zaga. Mm -hmm. Donnie lives mm -hmm. here, and I see him a lot. And man, he's got some stories about Rick Majerus. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Hey, if you see Donnie, you tell him I said hello. I love to be at Fullerton. I found out he was a shutter bug, and we became best of friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was at Fullerton. God, he. He was way too good of a man to be at Fuller's, and he was a fantastic human being and a damn good he coach. Is, he is a great guy, great person. We have lunch about once a week, and he is something else. Tell me this. Leave me with this. What did baseball mean to you? <laughs> well, it, it. I guess you could call it. It was a large part of my life. I mean – I was able to do this for 39 years after I finished playing. And so I, I never grew up. I never had a real job. Uh, you know, I played all my life or all my childhood was lucky to play in college and then started coaching it. So it's consumed my life basically. And, and, but it, you know, I've never had a real job, um, you know, People have always kind of made fun of me saying, that's not a real job. Do you, what else do you do? And I said, that's what I do. So I've been so lucky in the fact that I got to stay in a profession and be in a profession that was enjoyable to be out on the field, to be out in outside, be as diverse, you know, be an administrator, be a coach, be a, mentor be a, you know all the different hats that you wear uh, as a coach and 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 go through and have the relationships that you develop uh, you know over a course of a career and all the players that you you know had good impact on and and bad impact on I mean you you have all of that and you know I've just been so fortunate in the fact that I got to raise a family and and work in a profession that, uh, um, that, you know, you cared about and that you had most of the time you had fun doing it. So I've been for, really fortunate to have the sport of baseball in my life. I've, I've traveled the world. I've, I've, I've done so many other things that, that, that baseball provided me. So, um, it's been fantastic. I mean, it's not bad. You've never had to wear a suit and tie to work every day. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. I, I, I told myself when I retired, I'll never wear a tie again. And, and, 
<laughs> you know, and I had to wear it once a year before that. So, you know, at a banquet or something. And, and <laughs> a clip on. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have very good ro- wardrobe. You know, when I when I retired, I, I looked in my closet and I went, oh, my gosh, look at all this Under Armour Utah <laughs> gear. And, I, you know, I told I told Janet, I said, you know, please go buy me some T-shirts and some <laughs> some different shirts. Um, I'm tired of wearing to, turf shoes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to, you know, but uh, that that's still a problem. I walk, go into my closet and I go, oh, what am I going to wear today? I can't wear a Utah shirt again, but that's what happens. Hey, tell me this. I, I almost forgot this. Tell me how special it was for you to wear that baseball USA uniform <laughs> and coach on the national team. Um. It's the second greatest thing that happened to me in in baseball. The first thing that is the Pac-12 championship. Um, it, it it was the thrill uh, in '99 to be an assistant coach, in 2007 to be the pitching coach. You know, with Mike Weathers, um, and, and and travel the world that summer, basically playing and being in the Pan Am Games in Brazil. And then being named the, the, the manager, the head coach in 2010, have Dave Serrano with me and, and um, was a thrill of a lifetime. And the players that you, you coach, or I don't know if you coach those, you manage them, you <laughs> put them out on the field and say, please, you know, don't get hurt. And, and um, you know, excite of – tournaments that we were in and the people that we played against and the in the atmosphere that we were in. It, it was it was fantastic usa baseball is you know unbelievable organization and um boy it, it, those are special times for me um and i cher- i cherish th- those three summers that i that i spent with that and in, in 2010 is you know a huge, huge highlight of my, my career. Yeah. And there were some pretty damn good kids on that 2010 <laughs> roster. <You think? laughs> oh, oh, oh man. A you, couple- have, uh, you have Garrett Cole and, and Sonny Gray as your one and two pitchers and Tyler Anderson is your number three. You're pretty good. Yeah. You're and pretty then, good is right. I mean, you had, have- you had guys on that roster. I mean, you had Nick and Noe Ramirez, who both made yep. the show, yep. Dylan Flora, another kid from Fullerton that was yep. absolute. I mean, you guys were loaded with people. Well, Jackie Bradley was in center field, and yep. George Fair was in left field, and and a guy by the name of Mikey Matuk was in right field, who's play, a great player at LSU and made it to the big leagues. Yeah, uh, Drew Maggi from Arizona State was some kind of competitor. He was unbelievable. Um, guy that and he 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 made it to the big leagues had a long career in the minor leagues um fontana was our shortstop from florida he was good we had anthony rendon at third until he got he got hurt the first week first injury with his ankle (laughs) but um it too bad that that happened i would really wanted to watch him uh, Stevie Rodriguez was our uh, was our catcher. That's from, right. Uh, That's right. CJ was on that squad with you, right? Your 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 guy. Uh, he was supposed to be. He got hurt the last day of the Cape. Oh, uh, did uh, he really? Yeah, uh, yeah. I've never been so mad in my life because <laughs> that was gonna. You know, he was gonna be. You know, your own player on your own, on your USA team, and his last game uh, on the Cape before he reported to USA Baseball. He, he uh, tore his uh, ACL, oh Jesus, M- MPL or something. Right, something for God's sake. But that yeah. must have been though pretty special to wear that USA across the chest. It was, it was tremendous. Um, uh, it, it was tremendous, and we had great coaching staff with Dave and and then Nino Geritano and um, and Ed Blankmeyer was, mm-hmm. and I didn't know Ed before that. <clears throat> Ed was from St. John's and what a baseball guy he was, he is and, and uh, just learned so much. And, and it, it was a great tour. We ended in Japan and playing for the world championship in a, in a tournament and lost to Cuba in extra innings. And 
again, a game that you'll never forget because you, you lost it in, in extra innings, but, uh, um, what a, what a fantastic group that was. And, and, and then to see those guys and, and what they did and how far they've gone and how much money they made. (laughs) It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a pretty damn good experience. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, like we said, when we started, it's amazing uh, that Dave leg brought us together, but I'm, I'm really, really happy um, that we did get to meet. And we, we both know he was a wonderful human being. Uh, You know, I'm, I'm thankful for this time. I mean, I don't get to hang out with too many two time coaches of the year with 600 wins. So, (laughs) (laughs) so I, I appreciate you able being able to do this. I know you got a busy schedule. You got a baseball game tonight. Yeah, I'm going to go watch the Utes in uh, in Arizona State uh, play. It's uh, Utah's home opener. So now, how do you do? Are you pretty good in the stands? Can you watch a game? I, or I'm you... great now because I I don't I don't wake up with a pit in my stomach and I can go home whether you win or lose and and not be really upset. I'm, I'm cheering for the Utes and want them to win every game, but uh, it, it's it's a little bit different feeling and I kind of like it. Uh, can, you know, can you can you be a fan? Or, or is, there, yeah, yeah. is there a bit of a coaching? Call this, call that. <clears throat> no, um, I got. Uh, I, I, I'm not coaching at all. I don't. I, I just like to watch and, and enjoy the game and and hope for the players. You know that I still know many of the guys at, at Utah, so I'm a I'm a fan now and and um, um, have. I'm so happy. Gary Henderson's the head coach, and he was my assistant for two years and. He's a great, unbelievable, really good coach, and and uh, he's got a good staff with him, and uh, you know, so I, I I'm a big Ute fan now. I, I <laughs> I'd love to go to the football and basketball games, and and uh, you know whether they win or lose, it's not the same you know uh, feeling for me. Uh, you know, I want them to all win, but I you know I I I don't have to uh, you know. I, I, I told Gary the other day, he says, how are you doing? I said, I'm great. I didn't wake up with a pit in my stomach before, <laughs> like I know you did. You know, some guys can let it go. I don't know if you watched the Dodgers-Padres playoff game last year. It's at it's the game that the Padres win it. It's at home. It's pouring rain. And behind yeah. home plate is George Horton. Yeah. And it starts pouring rain. I got to text you this photo and everybody's covering up, but George and I've seen that look and I'm like, he's still coaching. Yeah. He's, he's wondering what the hell Dave Roberts is doing. He just won't let it go. I love him. He's so some coaches just can't let that horse go, but it's good that you have. (laughs) Well, you know, you're always thinking the game and, and, but you know, I know what they're going through and, and, uh, you know, I'll never second guess anybody because no. I know exactly what they're going through. And, and, um, I, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I want to feel good about my, you know, about my day and, and, uh, you know, I, I'm just happy that I, I get to go to the games and I get to be a fan and, um, and, and enjoy, I, I'm trying to enjoy uh, uh, retirement. You know, do I miss some? I, I miss a lot of parts of it, but but you know, I'm I'm trying to make sure that I'm enjoying. You know why I, I stepped away and and uh, yeah, it's time for you to have a normal life with normal yeah. clothes. Yeah, 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 normal clothes again. <laughs> Bill, you are absolutely the best. I'm so glad we met. You enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, if you see Donnie next week, you tell him I said hello. I'll do that. And if uh, Janet nudges you tonight and says, I can't believe they called that outside pitch on 2-0, you don't, just let her say what she wants to say. I'll do that. I'll do <laughs> I can't thank you enough, sir. Have a great hey, day. Man, thank you. And, and uh, hopefully we'll... Uh... We'll catch a game together here soon. Oh, I'd love to. Oh, man, I love sitting next to a coach and hearing what goes through your guys' mind. Good Lord, it's unbelievable. Yeah, that'd be uh, that'd be great. Hopefully I'll be in L.A. at some point and we can hook up. You let me know. I'll talk to you then. 
Okay, sounds good. All right, thanks, Bill. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Bill Kennenberg. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the like button and become a subscriber to the podcast. Remember, you can follow the Just a Good Conversation podcast on Instagram, and you can find all of our past shows at the website, justgoodconversation.com. Thank you for listening.